we're not quite at doom yet. Think more along the lines of Pong, um, and you'll be a little more uh, satisfied with it. So I'm going to get more into it. We, ha we aren't actually ready to start yet, but I do want to just start by talking a little bit about quantum technologies. Actually, I know what I can do while people are filtering in. We'll start at 732. And I will show you a video that gives you an introduction about quantum technologies. It's a cartoon. It's very high, it's very slickly produced. I actually really wanted to show it, but I didn't think there would be time. But now that we're a little bit early, why the heck not? YouTube, the source of all things that is good. Ow. Oh. Because I listen to a hell of a lot of YouTube music, that's why. Um, let's say... So let's, let's go! What, we're watching Kurgazats until we're ready to start. Yeah, that's... And here we go. My name is Josh, and I've been a forward member for five months. For Before forward, I was overweight, I was exhausted all the time. For most of our history, human technology consisted of our brains, fire, and sharp sticks. While fire and sharp sticks became power plants and nuclear weapons, the biggest upgrade has happened to our brains. Since the 1960s, the power of our brain machines has kept growing exponentially, allowing computers to get smaller and more powerful at the same time. But this process is about to meet its physical limits. Computer parts are approaching the size of an atom. To understand why this is a problem, we have to clear up some basics. A computer is made up of very simple components doing very simple things, representing data, the means of processing it, and control mechanisms. Computer chips contain modules, which contain logic gates, which contain transistors. A transistor is the simplest form of a data processor in computers, basically a switch that can either block or open the way for information coming through. This information is made up of bits, which can be set to either 0 or 1. Combinations of several bits are used to represent more complex information. Transistors are combined to create logic gates, which still do very simple stuff. For example, an AND gate sends an output of 1 if all of its inputs are 1, and an output of zero otherwise. Combinations of logic gates finally form meaningful modules, say for adding two numbers. Once you can add, you can also multiply, and once you can multiply, you can basically do anything. Since all basic operations are literally simpler than first grade math, you can imagine a computer as a group of seven-year-olds answering really basic math questions. A large enough bunch of them could compute anything from astrophysics to Zelda. However, with parts getting tinier and tinier, quantum physics are making things tricky. In a nutshell, a transistor is just an electric switch. Electricity is electrons moving from one place to another, so a switch ends, is a passage that can block electrons from moving in one direction. Come back to Today, her. a typical scale for transistors is 14 nanometers which is about eight times less than the HIV virus's diameter and 500 times smaller than a red blood cell's. As transistors are shrinking to the size of only a few atoms, electrons may just transfer themselves to the other side of a blocked passage via a process called quantum tunneling. In the quantum realm, physics works quite differently from the predictable ways we're used to, and traditional computers just stop making sense. We are approaching a real physical barrier for our technological progress. To solve this problem, scientists are trying to use these unusual quantum properties to their advantage by building quantum computers. In normal computers, bits are the smallest units of information. Quantum computers use qubits, which can also be set to one of two values. A qubit can be any two-level quantum system, such as a spin in a magnetic field or a single photon. Zero and one are this system's possible states, like the we photon's begin, horizontal or vertical polarization. The ends, in the quantum world, the qubit doesn't have to be in just one of those, it can be in any proportions of both states at once. This is called superposition. But as soon as you test its value, say by sending the photon through a filter, it has to decide to be either vertically or horizontally polarized. So as long as it's unobserved, the qubit is in a superposition of probabilities for 0 and 1, and you can't predict which it will be. 
but the instant you measure it, it collapses into one of the definite states. Superposition is a game changer. Four classical bits can be in one of two to the power of four different configurations at a time. That's 16 possible combinations out of which you can use just one. Four qubits in superposition, however, can be in all of those 16 combinations at once. This number grows exponentially with each extra qubit. 20 of them can already store a million values in parallel. A really weird and unintuitive property qubits can have is entanglement, a close connection that makes each of the qubits react to a change in the other's state instantaneously, no matter how far they are apart. This means that when measuring just one entangled qubit, you can directly deduce properties of its partners without having to look. Right, this qubit a manipulation we'll is a mind bender as well. A normal logic gate gets a simple set of inputs and produces one definite output. A quantum gate manipulates an input of superpositions, rotates probabilities, and produces another superposition as its output. So a quantum computer sets up some qubits, applies quantum gates to entangle them and manipulate probabilities, and finally measures the outcome, collapsing superpositions to an actual sequence of zeros and ones. What this means is that you get the entire lot of calculations that are possible with your setup all done at the same time. Ultimately, you can only measure one of the results, and it will only probably be the one you want, so you may have to double-check and try again. But by cleverly exploiting superposition and entanglement, this can be exponentially more efficient than would ever be possible on a normal computer. So while quantum computers will probably not replace our home computers, in some areas they are vastly superior. One of them is database searching. To find something in a database, a normal computer may have to test every single one of its entries. Quantum algorithms need only the square root of that time, which for large databases is a huge difference. The most famous use of quantum computers is ruining IT security. Right now, your browsing, email and banking data is being kept secure by an encryption system in which you give everyone a public key to encode messages only you can decode. The problem is that this public key right, folks, can actually get be started used to calculate your right secret private key. Two Luckily, doing the necessary math on any normal computer would literally take years of trial and error. But a quantum computer with exponential speed up could do it in a breeze. Another really exciting new use is simulations. Simulations of the quantum world are very intense on resources, and even for bigger structures such as molecules, they often lack accuracy. So why not simulate quantum physics with actual quantum physics? Quantum simulations could provide new insights on proteins that might revolutionize medicine. Right now, we don't know if quantum computers will be just a very specialized tool or a big revolution for humanity. We have no idea where the limits of technology are, and there's only one way to find out. This video is supported by the Australian Academy of Science, which promotes and supports excellence in science. I wanted to kill time till the panel started. I didn't want to take away time from myself, though. Um, oop. I am not great with this touchpad. All right. Oh, no. Um, yes, I am using this. It is free. It is not that button because this is not no not PowerPoint. It is Control F5, which goddamn, I have no idea where F5 is on this laptop. Hey, so this right here is a quantum computer. This is a superconducting quantum computer. Unfortunately, unlike your computers in your pockets, your smartphones, all your desktops, there's no standardized methodology of what the architecture is going to be or what a qubit looks like. So this is what it looks like without the dilution refrigerator around it. Again, the dilution refrigerator is a device that keeps this device colder than the temperature of outer space or at the order of millikelvins. So unbelievably cold, requires a lot of work to keep it this cold. And it, at that temperature, it has superconducting properties, which allow it to exhibit a lot of these quantum effects, and we can use it as a sort of a simulated atom. So let's go to the next slide. So the expectations, um, we're gonna hold off questions to the end, um, except for Kate, of course, my, my, my colleague. Um, no math, we're gonna try to focus more on the fun part of it, and we're not gonna really delve into the highly technical stuff, like, mm, that. I wouldn't say that was highly technical, but we're not going to get that technical in this panel. It's gonna be mostly focused around games and mostly focused around some high-level concepts to quantum computing. Um, I am Dan Ballou, these are my publications for the past year. You are welcome to look them up. 
Um, and our agenda today is we're going to talk about how you can use games to inform quantum research, why you should care about quantum computing, like not just a technology level, like, oh, it's cool because it has superposition. No, like what can it actually do for you? And um, quantum computing versus your normal computer you have at home. Uh, we're going to talk about quantum computers versus the graphics card in your computer or in your PlayStation. We're going to talk about gaming and quantum computers. And then we're going to talk about how to learn uh, gamify learning quantum next. So I really, this is my biggest regret of this entire presentation is that I cannot show you this. The truly bizarre um, experiment they used to prove this, um, basically it's a, there's a quantum physical effect that when you have something in superposition, once you measure it, not only does it, you, it, 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 there is a value of it, but also the, the partnered pair of this um, entangled, the um, particle also will be set. So if you know this one's a zero, the other one's gonna be a one. If this one's a one, this one's going to be a zero. Like, and it doesn't matter how far away they are. So they did this great test where they had people from all over the globe playing a game where they were testing them on the randomization of how well they could create random bits. And this game was utterly bizarre. You can see some of the graphics here. Unfortunately, the site is no longer up. This was from 2016. The music was utterly bizarre. It was by this team in Spain. Um, it was in collaboration with a lot of research laboratories all over the world. Um, they had thousands and th like tens of thousands of people playing this, uh, just typing in as fast as they can, competing in this weird game to create randomized particles. But just the way they motivated you to do it, there was a really heavy emphasis on design. There was a comic book on the web that you scrolled. It, everything was just amazingly well done. And unfortunately, the only video that survives of it is someone who is filming it as if Kate here was filming that screen and then turned the sound off on it. So it's like, it's uh, there's no point in showing it to you. I really, right, that, that, was, that would have been a truly cool thing. But basically the result of this was they used a video game to create randomization and then prove with a loophole free test. It wasn't like you can say, oh, well, we didn't control for this factor, so you can't really say this is the way it is. But they, they were able to prove that the, the value of the partner particle, which was in a lab across the world, changed faster than the speed of light. So, I mean, like this is like, we're talking like hundreds of a second, but when you're talking about something that changed in a thousandth of a second, you can say, well, this is faster than the speed of light. Ergo, not, nothing could have touched that. Nothing, like there's no force that could have interfered or caused this problem. It is just, it just is what it is. It's, it changed. It's not some other weird thing that caused that. There's no, so, and there's this other game called Quantum Moves 2, which is very, very cool. And I'm actually going to show you this one. Oops. There we go. Um, I have to load this one fresh. This is, all these things are a little bit on the janky side, but this is pretty cool. So this is a game where they're actually using how players play the game to inform how we take, we take over playing the game. drag this and it wants you to drag it in a very fast way in a very accurate way. Drag the thing to the right. So they use a lot of machine learning. They use like predictive analytics to figure out how to do this, but they wanted to watch thousands and thousands of players play this game to figure out what's the optimal way to prepare these atoms. So let's close out of here. I think so basically, yeah, this touchpad is, is killing me. So um, it, it's all the touchpad. It's, it's the it's the terrible player that blames the tools. Like, oh, my controller's broken. But um, so basically the idea was they wanted to see how players who wanted to get a better score actually were who were doing the best, how they did things, how they were, you know, thank you so much. <laughs>
some some hero had a, a mouse. So um, so basically, the idea was using a hybrid of human intuition with quantum algorithms to improve the way they control atoms in a laboratory. So this. The, Obviously, when you're controlling something, like an atom in a laboratory, you're doing it way faster than a human can drag a mouse. It's like milliseconds. But the idea is they can find a optimal pattern for doing this and say, okay, this person got the high score. This person had the best fidelity, all of this cool stuff. All right, next, please. Oh, use the, use the arrows. <laughs> there we go. Oh, oh. <laughs> Bless you. So, okay, so basically when you have a quantum computer, you have this superposition of zero and one, you have the, so when you have a bit, a bit is like a light switch, it's on or off, whereas a qubit can be like, here, imagine a surface of a, two D, of a sphere. So you can have a value that's anywhere there and you can manipulate the value while it's still in that sphere-like system, but then once you measure it, it's a zero or a one, you killed all that extra information. So it's cool, so the idea is it's a bunch, of, it's a lot of math and you can do calculations, like for example, Google, and there was this, Google, this group in China that used uh, light-based qubits to create results that were, you know, that would have taken decades to do on a regular computer, even the most powerful regular computer, and do them on a quantum computer in, you know, a couple hours, less than a day, which is really an amazing feat. Now, don't get me wrong, these are not necessarily useful problems or problems that anyone in this room cares about, including me, but nonetheless, it's a toy problem that showed, hey, here's something that a quantum computer can do to better than a classical computer. Next, please. Um, so why would you want to have a quantum computer? So you need to figure out this optimal solution. So quantum computers are really great at measuring a low energy system, figuring out the path of least resistance. And the idea is it's like a bunch of soapy water. So here is, boo, 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 boo. Why doesn't every home in the U.S. have solar panels? The number one reason is not about sunlight or weather or even politics. It's actually just because most... So, okay, here we go. So you can see... Well, why isn't this not... You can see the water knows... A lot of quantum computing is basically that. You're figuring out what's the lowest energy state, what is like, you know, like water figures this out naturally. It's an intuitive, natural system for optimizing paths. So when you have water and it settles, it's settling in its lowest energy position, and it is the most efficient way that water can settle. So if you want to think about how a quantum computer computes a lot of these optimization algorithms, like for example, uh, one of the things that, are, that is being experimented is with like delivering Uber Eats or you know Uber, or like logistic optimization. Like we have a bunch of cars we need to paint. Should, which cars do we paint first? How do we do this without changing the paint hoses and changing the paint colors? Like we want to figure this out. What's the least path of least resistance? The path of you know the least gas being wasted, or the you know the, your your food will get to you the quickest and you know it's the le it's the lowest amount of feet traveled like that kind of stuff so it's all this when you think of quantum computing just think of this kind of idea and i think what's interesting about a quantum computer is you could make a quantum computer without ever making a classical computer without making like a regular you know transistor silicon based you know your intel or amd processor they're really cool like that in fact a uh a classical computer has more in common with an abacus than it does with a quantum computer. They're just a completely different technology base. They work different. Um, you can think of a more like a pseudo kind of analog computer, whereas a regular computer is digital. So they're really neat. Um, sorry, that's terrible. That's a non slide trick. They're neat. Please don't put that on the, the quote like Dan said, computers were neat. Um, so, all right. So, but here's the real kind of crux of the problem. The cartoon we had on before kind of pointed this out. These quantum, uh, regular computers are getting to the point where we're reaching that the gates are going to be at the size of an atom or around the size of an atom, and you get these weird quantum effects. There's a limitation on how much farther the technology can go. That being said, we're not reaching it yet. We, there's still a lot more cool stuff innovative engineers can do, but it's inevitable that there is a end run of what classical computers can do. Um, right, whoa, whoa, let's go back. Um, 
And I want to say like, so basically the, the time scales exponentially. There's a lot of problems we just can't solve, like chemical simulation, making new and cool materials, making new and cool pharmaceutical drugs. Now, I know that sounds a little hollow in an era when we can make a vaccine for COVID in four days, which is how Pfizer made it. But there's a lot of like, think about battery technology. Like, you know, think about like, imagine if someone could make like battery technology hasn't gotten that much better. It's like getting incrementally better. But if you had a quantum computer that was a really good one, you could, it could get exponentially better. So let's go, let's move on. Um, so basically, like I said, quantum computers, um, there's a sphere that you, you're, you're measuring. The, the, the value can be anywhere on this, outside the sphere, whereas the classical bit, it's a light switch. And not only that, though, you can use a quantum algorithm. Matt, you know, like when you throw a stone in water and the water goes like this, and it kind of focuses in on this one little area, like, but it creates these waves. So you can use interference patterns to like make it do the calculations way faster. And uh, whereas with a, you know, the, the classical uh, computers, it's just a kind of a brute force thing. So, you know, basically what's different about it is it does entanglement, it does interference, and it does superposition. And interference is that kind of thing where it's like, I have it amplifying the correct answer and I have it like decrementing the incorrect answer. So next, please. So what I really want to get at is, you know, right now we have about quantum computers that have about 100 qubits. They're not great. But that's the best of the best. There's, a, there's less than probably 30 quantum computers in existence that are publicly available in the entire world. Now, there's more than 30 computers. I'm looking at one of them right now in the world, like in this, and it's just this room. So like they're, they're, they're very new, they're very nascent. But once we get to about 300 qubits, the amount of information you can store and the amount of calculation you can do is more than just the um, atoms in the universe. Like once you hit about 80, Qubits, you can't simulate that on a regular on, on a classical computer. It's it's like right now, it's like oh, usually I do my like I do my work on a simulator because it's just easier, and then I run it on a on a quantum computer when I just want to get my special results. But eventually, like you know, like this year we have a hundred qubit computer. We can't simulate that yet, except for for like very very specific problems because there's a lot of like when you simulate something, you're doing a lot of like heuristics on it. So let's move on. So quantum computers is like a 1960s or 70s computer. I'm not sure anybody remembers this computer here. This is the Commodore PET. This was in the 1977. This thing is terrible. Um, my friend has one in his basement. He's very nostalgic about it. Um, but basically, when you think about your phone or you think about your computer at home, you're like, you don't worry about it giving you an error. Like the, the processors are so good now that you don't even worry about errors. With a quantum computer, you got to worry about errors. So, which makes it very hard to design games for or run things effectively. But it's also something you can kind of use effectively if you're really, really clever. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about when we get to the, the more gaming related section. So they're very early stage. Think of like something like a Commodore 64 or an Apple II with 4K of RAM rather than your computer, which has over four gigs of RAM and has like this awesome processor. So, okay, let's, let's go next. All right, so, and what I mean by that is they're very noisy. So this is actually, um, a, I recreated this simulation, but basically this is a, uh, there's this movie called The Fly. It's an old movie. Uh, it's got Jeff Goldblum in it. You should watch it. He's great. He's like super fit. This is his prime of his life. It made him famous, right? So anyway, so the idea is right here, this fly, you have it perfectly on the left. You, you teleport it. Now you can actually do teleportation in a quantum computer. Like you can actually teleport qubits. Like it's really cool. But um, that's actually one of the mechanisms by how it works, teleportation. It's obviously, you know, a tiny atom or an electron, but you know, whatever, it's, it's still like there, it's a thing you can do and that's pretty cool. But the point is, is that um, when I, you know, when you run this, this is a very deep circuit, it gets a lot of errors, especially on the older hardware when this was run on. So let's, let's go next. So the errors scale exponentially along with the amount of information you store. But think about it this way, when you have a computer, like any computer you use, it's all based around kind of the same kind of architecture. It's all silicon based. It's all kind of the same like basic technology. Like even if it's an ARM processor or an x86 processor, like, you know, whatever, it's all kind of the same deal. Like it's, it's kind of based around the same family of technology. We don't have that yet for quantum computers. It's all over the place. You have like superconducting qubits that have to be kept colder than space. Same thing with these, um, trapped ions that are really cool. They have this magnetic field that surrounds them on all sides and they keep this atom uh, in space, like uh, kind of like rotating in between all these magnetic fields and then they like beam a little like photon at it and they poke it and it moves around and it changes the energy level. And so they, um, and then you have stuff like, um, you know, photonic, which is just 
just just basically you're just smacking a, a fake atom with light. Uh, you got silicon spin. You got topological qubits, uh, and then you got like you, know, you got all these. Things. No one knows which one's going to be the winner. You can say this one's my favorite right now, but these things are still in the running. Like for all we like right now, if I had to put a money down, I would say to be trapped ions or superconducting. I could lose a lot of money on that bet, depending on how much I bet. So let's go next. This is what the computer looks up like up close when you take the refrigerator off of it. Um, they're very sensitive to microwave radiation. They're very delicate. They're, uh, they have to be kept super duper cold. Um, they're basically the only people running them are research laboratories or research divisions of major companies. Next, please. So, oh, and it's movie time. So this is a movie made with the, the control technologies for a quantum computer. Oh no. Okay, cool. It worked. Um, so basically, this, these are individual atoms that are being moved around by their control technologies. I'm not going to say this movie is going to win an Oscar or anything, but the fact that this is literally individual atoms being turned into a flick is, is kind of amazing. you're hating it. All right, and that is it. All right, let's let's let before this auto plays a commercial or just like I I'm trying. Oh no. There's a time limit. Oh no, I didn't get it in time. Okay, cool. We do. I should put it over here. And thank you. Thank you for providing the mouse, by the way. All right. So, oh, yay. Oh, this thing works so well. This is a great mouse. I'm going to buy one of these. Um, so anyways, things you can do. Game development. Uh, breaking cryptography. I want to get a hoodie like that. I need my hacker hoodie because like all hackers have hoodies that completely cover their face like a doomsday cloak. Uh, drug design. That's going to be a big one. Drug design, like material design, like it, just in 20 years, there's going to be materials that can do things you wouldn't even believe. Like just it's it's going to be because uh, right now it's it's so hard to simulate any kind of new material. Anyway, that's not why you're here. You're here for games. So optimization, machine learning. Right, X, please. Um, quantum crypto. I do want to talk about this for just a second before we move on to games, though. This is why everybody cares about quantum computing right now, why there's just money pouring into it, because all the encryption on your phone and your crypto account, all this shit, it's going to go away. Like, there's crap. Quantum computers are really good at breaking um, encryption in a way that really your, no your normal computer can't. Your normal computer is just brute forcing it. Like, is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Whereas a quantum computer will get the wrong answer, but it'll interfere out incorrect answers and amplify more correct answers. And it will just slowly, slowly swim towards the correct answer, but it'll do, it has a directionality to the algorithm. So when you recode something in a quantum algorithm, you can really take advantage of this amplitude and interference of these quantum patterns. Amazing, it's just so much, you can really speed things up. However, it's, it's math, it's hard, it's not easy to set up. It's not like you're like, oh, I'm just gonna download this package and get it to work. Anyway, next please. So um, how long till we can just compute antiviral drugs? Like, imagine you can just like throw it in there. You can actually simulate how these chem... Oh, just keep clicking right. Okay. So you can just like simulate the idea, just make it really fast. Just throw out a bunch of different types of molecules, like simulate them very fast. Right now, this stuff just takes oodles and oodles of time. So let's, let's go to the next slide. All right, quantum computing and game complexity. 
So some of you might recognize some of these puzzles. Uh, there's the Zelda box puzzle up there. There is um, a Legend of Zelda from uh, the newer Legend of Zelda game over there. And then there is uh, from the Super Nintendo. It's not newer. It's newer than the other one, I guess. But <laughs> and, po and old school Pokemon. So obviously these games are a little old. Um, that's about what you can teach a computer to play right now. But the idea is this is about computational complexity. How can we improve this using a quantum computer? So for ex I got this picture of Quake 3 here because uh, John Carmack from id, he actually made a new mathematical algorithm which did a very important mathematical problem quicker. So it was like, it's not perfect. It's got little air bars around it, but it does it super duper fast. And like, usually like academic people, that's not what they're concerned with, but he made this thing. He just like, oh, I'm just gonna make it do this. And it's like, he made it up in like a month. And it's this thing that wound up being this really cool mathematical concept that everybody uses in games. Anyway, so computational complexity is basically, um, whether, how do you solve this? Can a computer solve this? Computers are really bad at solving puzzles, like human puzzles, like this box puzzle, they might be able to solve, but like computers in general, it's hard to make an, an, an intelligence that can solve multiple types of puzzles. So quantum computers are better at simulating quantum systems, like I said, so you can make really realistic physics in the future, and that's, that's a long time away. But the really big thing is that, think of classical computers as like Lego blocks, and think of like a quantum computer as being able to manipulate things like a technic block. So it can it has this more granular level of control. I can, you know, instead of just doing a on or off one or zero, you can do it in between there. You can ha do a half a gate. You can do like half of this or a quarter or an eighth or something. So you can manipulate these values between one and between uh, one and zero. It's it can do some really neat stuff. So let's go to the next slide, please. So basically, why can't we just use it like a GPU? And that's a good question. And um, so for example. Uh, back in 1995, uh, Virtual Fighter, which is actually downstairs, I believe that it's a partner game, Daytona is also downstairs. So NVIDIA and Sega were the rulers of 3D in 1995. That was NVIDIA's first product they ever made. That was a time when Sega actually had the best 3D ever. I don't know how they messed that one up, but um, <laughs> but no, but seriously, this this now people like, that's what NVIDIA made their stuff for originally, it was just gaming. And, um, but, or before that, before like, you know, probably like about 1995, 1994-ish, um, any, any 3D was used for CAD drawing. And it was in these really expensive workstations that cost like $10,000. And it was only used by people who were doing like really complicated design work and like in, a, in, a, in a, like at a professional work setting. Then people go, hey, you know what? We could use this for games. And then they made, you know, then they made these arcade games, which are awesome. They have the PlayStation came out, Saturn, all this stuff like this, and the very early 3D cards and all this cool stuff like that. But the point being is that eventually people figured out, hey, wait a minute, I can use these 3D cards to like do all kinds of cool calculations, deep learning. Like, you know, when you use Facebook or you use like any social media or Google, they're doing stuff on the back end that's using a 3D processor. It's made by a company that was just like, you know, this guy. Um, Wang there, um, Jen, Jensen Huang, he, he was just like, I wanna make kick-ass 3D cards for games. That was his original idea. Now he's like making things that are like accelerating searches and making better predictions and AI models and stuff. It's crazy. It's like, it, no one would have predicted that back then. And I think that's kind of the same thing is eventually quantum computers are gonna be able to do something that we can't predict now because they're so nascent. However, what we can make a prediction about is they're gonna be really good at making procedural content. That's the big thing right now that's near future. You can actually do potentially do that is the idea that you can make more realistic, authentic, like everyone here who's in the games probably has played a game that has procedural content and you're like, I've already seen this room 10 times. I've seen this combination. I know if these three things come together, the next thing's gonna be this one. Cause it's using some kind of like, you know, basic classical algorithm where it's like, I'm gonna generate content and it's either a little bit boring or it's very predictable, or you know, sometimes they do it really good and they're able to hide the seams of the procedural generation. But for the most part, there's a limit to what they can do with a classical computer. You can do more interesting stuff. Uh, there's a whole talk about this by this guy, James Wooten, and I didn't give him credit on the last slide. A lot of, a lot of that slide came from the, all those little pictures um, those little pictures of like the Zelda and the Pokemon and all that stuff. That came from James Wooten's paper. He did some really cool groundbreaking research. Um, we're gonna talk about him a little more actually. But um, anyway, so yeah, you can make better puzzles with a uh, quantum computer. But um, also you can, 
but basically the idea is you would want to use it like a supplemental processor. Like you, your computer has a GPU, maybe in the future it'll have a QPU. More likely it'll be on the server side and the server will do some cool stuff and then it'll send it down as an update or some sort of streaming content. So, so yeah, basically think of it, it's not quite there yet. This is where 3D was in the early 80s, not the late 80s with in terms of quantum computing. Next please. So here's the first. So. There's a reason I saved quantum games themselves for last. They're not actually all that impressive. Um, think if, when I said think in terms of Pong, I was not. Uh, so they actually have a, a, a cool Pong where it is um, a classical computer versus a quantum computer. And usually the classical computer wins at Pong. So that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. But, um, but it's like one of those things where it's a tutorial that you do in like his kit. So it's not like, you know, like the cutting edge Pong on a quantum computer. But basically, we're, we have a lot of error-prone computers. It makes it very hard to program something that's really more effective than a, like for an AI, at least. People say, oh, the future AI is going to be great for quantum computing. It's like, yeah, that's that future is a decade away. Like There'll be a lot more MAGFest before that happens. Um, but also, there's, there's not a whole lot of uh, pr computers to run these things on. So if it's something that has to keep hitting the quantum computer and doing updates, that's not going to go well. So um, a lot of what we have here is we have, so this guy, James Wooten, he actually made the first quantum computer game. It's called Cat Box Scissors. It's rock, paper, scissors. And the only reason I point this out is because that was 2017, folks. The first quantum game on a, that runs on a quantum computer natively was 2017. So yeah, like, yeah, you're going to see stuff around MAGFest that's been, like, you see game, go to that computing museum that's over there. You'll see games from the 60s, the 70s. Like, yeah, this the, the track record here is, is pretty uh, shallow. So anyway, so you have stuff like Quantum Battleship. It's, it's pretty cool. It actually uses quantum principles to, like, predict whether you hit a battleship. So, you know, like, it uses a lot of the logic of a quantum computer to say, hey, you did hit that battleship, or, oh, you hit it, but you didn't actually destroy it because of this quantum principle. But anyway, so... He actually made an engine, like a, like a, what do you call it? Um, a, yeah, a game engine, I guess, for working on a quantum computer that interfaces with Unity. That's what some of this stuff, like this uh, dragon game that's over there does. Um, so there's this game that's actually on your phone. It's called the Universe Splitter. Now, one of the big things that's gonna really help out gaming for quantum computer, especially like casino gaming, but any gaming that requires true number randomization, every, computer right now can't be truly random. It's, it can be mostly random. It can be pretty good at doing random, but it can never be truly random. Quantum computers can actually create a truly random number. So this person just basically made an app called Universe Splitter. It's a coin flip app. It's a very fancy coin flip app. It's got a lot of like graphics and bells and whistles and you put it into your decision like a magic eight ball. Like, should I go to MAGFest or should I stay home and be sad? And like and then you press the button, but it actually hits a quantum device that provides a truly random number, which is kind of cool. Like, but again, you know, that's, that's not doom. You know what I mean? We're not there yet. That's no, there's no source ports for Doom yet. Anyway, so um, Quantum Gate Quest. This is actually a pretty cool way to learn about like quantum physics. It actually interfaces with a quantum back end. Uh, Drogon is dead. I'm going to show you this one. This one's the best quantum game. It's actually like a, a legit good game. It's Ikaruga with like a Game of Thrones theme. When this was made, Game of Thrones was still something people didn't hate. Um, and then there's Qubit the Barbarian, which actually looks really nice and runs on a quantum back end. So, and I'm going to use a mouse this time. So there's also this game called Agent Q that's pretty neat. Um, I can figure out how to get this one. Why won't you play? Yeah, this is the one I can't figure out, so. Yep, this is where we're at, folks. It says press something. Zero. No, it's not zero. Can you click in the box? I appreciate the spirit of the audience. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. That's a great idea. Oh, you are a genius. XCZV. All right. So that's exact. Yeah. Okay. That person deserves a Magfest medal. Um, yeah, I'm pressing XCV. Okay, this keyboard is. Let's not deal with it. Anyway, you can just look at Conan the Barbarian. So this is actually running on a quantum back. <laughs> oh no. Hey Dave. Damn you, you Google, doing? YouTube. Trying to find this time. Monetizing your content. So, okay, so the idea here is that when you move and you touch any of these walls, it actually sends these, uh, it sends data to the back end on a quantum computer and it sees what happens next. So it's like you interact with these walls and you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. It's, again, it's this procedural generation, random number generation, which are the things that a quantum computer is going to be really, really good at. So, I mean, this one's actually pretty neat. I mean, I think the unpredictability of it makes it not as fun for me because I actually kind of like to know what's going to happen when I interact. Like when I play Mr. Drill or I drill down, I know I'm going down. Like, I don't, I don't, the wall doesn't appear behind me. So, uh, the only other problem I have with this is none of the um, text other than this video is in English about it. So, I don't actually know what it's doing on a quantum backend, but I, I made some assumptions. Um, so, <coughs> all right. So, okay, how about this? You can take a look at this Drogon. I was gonna try to like epically show you how I was gonna like kick this Drogon game's butt and get like all the high scores. Like you would just, you can just imagine in your head the glory of how I was gonna speed run this, but um, I would have died. But the idea is you just like, it's Ikaruga where you can turn red and blue and you can capture the arrows of the colors, blah, blah, blah. It's actually fun. Um, you can take my word on that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so so yeah, so here's like a way you can learn quantum physics is by gamifying it. And that, I think this is actually really helpful. So this game, Hello Quantum, actually really good. It's really good about learning how, about quantum physics and quantum computing. Um, I do not work for IBM. I have no dog in this fight. Um, I do not, they make this. Uh, they also made a board game, which you can download as a PDF or you can get a box version. Uh, you, PDF's probably just as good, just print it out in your printer. Um, again, it's like this like Galaxy four times a four X conquest game. Like you get, it's actually pretty deep. Um, Quantum moves. I showed you that one earlier. That's the one. It's actually you're helping people do research by playing that game, or you were. They kind of stopped that part of it. They're just keeping the game up because people actually like playing it. Um, and then there's this place called Quantum Games Cafe. Um, they basically have like every year they have kind of like, oh, we're gonna make games to kind of gamify quantum and help you know quantum literacy. And uh, they have this game called Quantum Cats. Cats you can get on your phone. It's basically Angry Birds, but the cats have quantum properties. It's actually kind of it's actually good. And especially if you like cats. If you hate cats, I wouldn't play it. <laughs> um, and then. There's the Quantum Game Jam, which happens every year, uh, usually in a European country where they do not speak English. So it's hard to actually play some of these games, but a lot of them demand that you download Python and then install this um, engine that this guy, James Wooten, made. Oh, by the way, one thing. Um, all, like, like the first game was made by that guy, James Wooten. So like, you know, mad credit to him. Like if it wasn't for him, this panel wouldn't even exist. And then there is Quantum Chess. How much time do we have? Um, we have time. So I will show you this. And um, actually, I'll take some questions. Does anyone have any questions before I start this video? Yes, but you back there. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, the big problem with quantum computers right now is they actually don't have memory. <laughs> quantum memory doesn't exist. I actually had a slide on this, but I thought it was a little too technical. So basically there's a quantum principle called the no cloning principle, which means that you can't clone quantum information. You can measure it. And once you measure it, you've changed it and to a certain extent destroyed other parts. Like remember I said, like you have this sphere, you're measuring things, it's in this two dimensional analog space then you measure it and it boils down to a one or a zero. So think about it this way. If it's a uh, 51%, it goes up to one. If it's 49%, it goes down to zero kind of thing, right? So 
But the problem is, is you can't just make a, you can make a copy of that quantum state. You can say, oh, I'm gonna make a copy of that. I'm gonna make the exact opposite value or entangle two, two atoms. And then I will still have the entangled atom even if I observe the original atom. But you can't make a direct copy. I can't say, okay, I'm gonna back up the values of these four registers to another four registers. I can make the opposite copies. It's, it's a process that requires an entire circuit. Long story short, there's no such thing as quantum memory until they release it later this year, which is actually a brand new thing. I haven't gotten to got my hands on it. I just seen some presentations that say, hey, you can buy this. It's like $100,000 for like a very small amount of it. And that's the cheap, that's the cheaper one. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so long story short, um, however, what is cool about it is you will have the ability to have these larger um, amounts. So you could actually have things running in a quantum computer once the megahertz gets up, because right now they're in the megahertz, not the gigahertz, which is not great. Um, but you'll be able to load all the data in there and you'll have be able to store more than a classical computer could ever hope to store. But the problem is you don't actually have working memory. You're storing it on the process. Imagine this. Imagine if you had a processor that could store gigabytes of data, but you don't have the memory to manipulate it between the storage and there. So like it's you have to be really clever about how you get it in there. It's like this weird side loading. Like it's horrible. Like, like right now, like my it makes my job a lot harder. And it, and people have to be very patient. I'm like, well, I'll get your results. Just give me a couple of weeks. Like <laughs> this is gonna take some time to engineer everything. It's not just like you put a you know you put like a USB drive in and like just press copy, like it's not the same thing. So anyway, um, I actually did want to show you one other thing. Um, eh, I'm, I'll just tell you about it. So there's a- Welcome there is, to sound was critical. That is, that's just music. But um, so, so one other thing is they have a Minecraft that was made to interface with a quantum computer. So what you do is you basically, it's kind of like a portal to a certain extent where you go into different, you go into a room and solve puzzles, but instead of solving puzzles, I mean, instead of like using a portal to solve puzzles, you have to use different types of gates to get around the room and shit. And then it actually sends the circuit you make to a quantum computer on the back end, and then it allows the door to open if you did it right. So, you know, I'll tell you this, you're probably not gonna be like your new favorite game. But um, it's actually a pretty cool idea, and it's actually like a legit game that interfaces with a quantum back end. Now, again, it's kind of like you could probably play the game without the quantum back end and just, just have it verified in a simulator, but whatever. Like, it's cool that it interfaces with it. So. Oh, I'm sorry, you had a question too. Yes. Yes, uh, you could just ask it. So um, there's there's one thing that I've been working on for a while, and it's basically a modification of the Doom engine. Yeah. Which uses uh, a pair of space filter thing in the Doom engine, but uses it as a way of uh, toggling measurement of a quantum state in the environment in which you're playing the Doom game. And so depending on the output of a uh, avalanche diode uh, RNG, it'll determine what functions are characteristic to the level in the game. I was wondering if anyone else has done like a, a first person shooter that uh, takes quantum. Uh, nope. Okay. No one's done anything like that. If you do that, you will be the first, you will get a publication, you will get like, you'll you'll get into like the media for this. I, yeah, I, they'd be I'm really right. Get a Nobel Prize. I'm not aiming that. No, you'll get some attention for it for sure. Um, but I'll say what you might want to do is think about interacting, interfacing with a quantum random number generator. There's a lot of these. Or actually, some of them are um, either really good simulators, which are easy to get access to and kind of cheap. But there's these actual genuine quantum number simulators. Now, yeah. one of the reasons I really went off on this whole random number generation thing with quantum is anybody who's in cybersecurity will tell you like, oh yeah, numbers actually aren't as random as you think they are. Like anytime they update a standard. It's like a lot of times a standard is made by people who don't necessarily like make the best decisions. They make a decision that's easy to implement or like it works well with legacy software. And a lot of times the, the random number generation is, is, is frankly not very good. Yeah, which is why I was using an avalanche diode yeah. instead. Um, I'm just planning on putting a photon counter in based on that. So that'll be more of an interesting thing. Yeah, no, do you have a GitHub? Uh, please come up and like let um, me know about this. I would love it. It's just a side project. I might publish it later. Because I would love, I would love to hear more about this. Please, yeah, um, here, here's my card, actually. Um, so, anyway, uh, any any other questions? Yes. Um, I don't know if you can one, but I do want to say this in earnest. Is there a quantum computing game show, and if not, how would you design one? 
There is not, but it would be awesome. <laughs> you could easily, you could, the, the best thing we got right now is quantum chess. Like there's quantum chess tournaments. That's about all we got. So, uh, <laughs> but no, but seriously, like I, I don't know how you would design it, but you could try to use like uh, the principles of like superposition and entanglement and stuff like that and try to use it as a role. like, so you're entangled with me and like, you know, if I give one answer, you have to give the opposite answer. And I, oh, someone's yeah. got to pick what's the, what's the correct answer or something. But uh, oh, that's great. yes. Currently, no. Um, they're all based around these other architectures where you're basically simulating an atom and then you're shooting photons at it in some way or manipulating its energy level with microwaves or something. And then you're um, doing some sort of different transformations to uh, make it to different energy levels and then you're observing what happens at the end. And then you try to pair it with other qubits and then you try to manipulate them too to get this larger result so, so you know long story short when you have multiple bit qubits they can work they work together whereas individual bits in a regular computer are independent of one another qubits are dependent on one another and that's what gives it the really cool effects that make it cool yeah or that make it interesting and able to solve new problems yes uh so in the beginning you have a picture of the uh, IBM quantum computer without any of the refrigeration. Yes. Uh, we're going to put bananas in the picture. How big is that? Is that like size of two? Is that like a lunchbox? Because, you know, 1960 computers were like warehouse size. And okay. Uh, so roughly. that's a great question. And uh, some of them are literally the size of this chandelier. They kind of look like steampunk chandeliers. Um, some of them are about this big. Some of them are like this big. Like the. And it's not necessarily how much processing power it has. It's the architecture. Like the IBM ones are pretty big. Um, University of Maryland actually has a fab for making quantum computers. They are doing amazing stuff. Like you, everybody here, like you have no idea the level of world class University of Maryland quantum computing work. Like that's where this company IonQ, which is the first um, publicly traded quantum computing company spun out of like they're they're doing amazing amazing stuff over there so yeah and theirs are like tiny and their their stuff is amazing <coughs> however they also have um this lab and this is the craziest thing i've ever seen so they have this thing it's like it looks like this mixing table over here like you ever took a big dj mixing table it's like that but it goes all the way back to where you are and Scully's he's like you know like when you walk into like a refrigerator in like a grocery store it's got those little like plastic things that hang down it's got that <coughs> And it has a sign that says, if you go below the table, that you can get blinded because there's so many lasers. And it's all like this custom, like jury rigged shit. And it's all like this ion. It's, it's super cool. And it's got this rack of like monitoring equipment. It, it looks, it is, it is amazing. Super cold and super cool. <laughs> it is super cold. Actually, this one's more room temperature. It's kind of an experiment. But anyway, yes. Uh, I was gonna just say, I there. That's awesome. That is the coolest place I have ever been. And then we went to see like uh, your sister lab, the Army um, Research Lab, where they're doing a lot of stuff with the, the, they make fake diamonds. And this guy had the coolest thing he said. He basically said like, you know, real diamonds that you dig out of the earth, they're garbage. He's like, I don't use garbage. Like, I asked him like, so can you use, do you have to make all your diamonds or do you have to like, uh, can you just use regular diamonds? He's like, no, nah. he's like, he just like scoffs. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, you gotta use like, you gotta make these diamonds, like the diamonds that you put in a ring or they're only good for jewelry. It's like, no, he's just had this like attitude about diamonds. It was great. Uh, it was Dr. Wadsworth. That guy is, that guy had one of the best, that I think the best pitch I've ever heard a scientist give about the future of quantum. And I'm not gonna like say it cause I, I have, there's probably an NDA or something, but like he had, such a vision and I was just like yeah I'm on board this is great like this, this is amazing like the stuff you're doing he's doing a lot of diamond vacancy stuff and um, yeah that guy's great um, anyway yeah so I love University of Maryland I think that they are literally like um, of all the universities that I visited they're, they're doing stuff that is just mind blowing and they're right nearby like they're literally like where my friend lives Matt over there so yeah, I really yeah. that's awesome yeah, we're 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 talking to those folks. So anyway, um, uh, any, any any other questions? Yes. Yeah, we talked about uh, you know being able to be able to get uh, true written numbers. Do you have any other um, I guess ways or um, more applicable methods that uh, quantum computing can give us uh, components for making games? Uh, I mean, I can see you know obviously all the interest problems like you know, pathfinding and stuff like that. You know, like ideas to say, hey, these are components we will have to 
Well, okay, yes, and I totally forgot to bring it up. It was, I didn't put it on my slide, and I was like, I put it in the speaker notes, and I'm like, I'll remember to say that, but uh, I didn't. So basically, one of the ideas is you can use the noise in a quantum computer, because right now they're kind of noisy, which really limits their ability to do a lot of things. However, that guy, Dr. James Wadsworth, said, hey, wait a minute, not Wadsworth, sorry, Wooten, um, the guy who works at IBM, and he's thinking about how you use them in the gaming industry. That's like a big chunk of his job. Anyway, um, he was like, well, how can we use this noise to our advantage? So he's like, I know what we can do. So this whole procedural generation idea, but he's like, how do we make skins? How do we make maps? We can have this noise be a part of the map. So it's actually a feature, not a detriment. So it's like, he's he basically is like, okay, so I'm gonna have a four player game. I'm gonna create a map procedurally starting around these four center points and it creates like a different map that is more interesting because of the noise. It's not this perfect classical mechanism where it's just like, okay, well, you know, we get these, you know, we get this chunk of land, this chunk of land, this chunk of land. Every time you play it, you see those chunks of land over and over again. There's, there's just this level of noise that makes everything a little bit different and richer. Uh, he also used it to create textures in Minecraft. So you can, and in some of the levels he created were really beautiful. I don't know how many he had to run to get these levels, how many times it was actually run, but long story short, there's some really cool stuff you can do with creating original, interesting, unique content based around the errors, based on the fact that it's not so deterministic, it's more probabilistic. Yeah. So um, I want to like add to the answer to this question. Um, there's three things I have in mind as far as applications for quantum computing and gaming. Uh, the first off is real-time ray tracing, because obviously you can map all the points of light and uh, figure out exactly how it uh, calculates the graphical field. That's, that's the first thing. Um, second thing, uh, quantum uh, quality assurance. So you can trace every path that the game code takes uh, independently at the same time. Mm -hmm. So with a quantum computer, you don't have to iterate through and do uh, computational workloads. You can just go in one direction and have all the directions mapped out. And the third thing I actually forgot offhand, um, but it had some, oh, AI. Uh, you can use quantum to like with the Q, uh, QA uh, scenario, you can map out artificial intelligence pathways and have a more uh, a less deterministic uh, function applied to like enemy enemy behaviors. Yeah, and I think those are longer term things. I'm trying to focus on like next five, next six year things. Uh, but yeah, those are long term. Like the, that's like a decade away. But um, but yeah. So all right, I'm gonna show you some Paul Rudd.